Atamare Koto, Koma, join the TNA, no Hokianga Aho. It's my pleasure to be the moderator for this very important session, improving public uh, understanding of international affairs. Definitely a, a key theme in our keynote speakers this morning. Uh, as, as Dr. Grant said, the troubled part of that is well. Um, well known and what we want to do today is get some solutions. So um, if, in, a, in a world where most of our domestic issues are global in nature, whether that be climate change, mitigation, um, climate change adaptation, uh, the global pandemic, which we've all just been through, um, cyber security, or should I say insecurity, all of these things are global in nature, yet we still have headwinds headwinds that are impacting the public understanding and importantly engagement in international affairs. So to speak to this very important topic today, uh, we have a highly acclaimed panel. Um, first up, we have Edward Carr, who will join us at a awful hour, probably close to midnight in London um, online. So Ed is the deputy editor of The Economist uh, and having previously been the foreign editor and editor of business and economic coverage during the global financial crisis. Uh, before that, um, Ed was at the Financial Times. Our second panellist is Josie Pagani. So Josie has worked in aid, politics, media, trade, you name it, for several years. Uh, she's very involved in progressive think tanks in the UK and Europe and is an award-winning columnist, um, a weekly columnist, so you can get your weekly fix of Josie Pagani uh, in stuff. So very delighted to have you today, Josie. And our third and final panellist is Sir Peter Gluckman, um, highly acclaimed for his current role with uh, Koi Tu uh, as a distinguished professor at the University of Auckland, also very well known as a former chief science advisor to the New Zealand Prime Minister and um, special um, envoy to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade during the key administration. Welcome, Sir Peter. So without further ado, I will hand over to Ed. Uh, who is beaming in from London and um, at a very late time for him. So thank you, Ed. Over to you. Well, thank you, Mark, and tēnā katoa katoa. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Alas, by Zoom rather than in person, uh, but that's my loss, not yours. Now, I, I want to start by telling you about an experiment. In 1970, a psychologist called Henri Teifel, who worked at the University of Bristol, in the southwest of the UK, got 48 boys from the same school, aged between 15 and 16, and asked them to choose between two unsigned pieces of art, one by Vasily Kandinsky and the other by Paul Clay. And the boys were then allocated to a Kandinsky team and a Clay team. And they thought this was according to the picture they'd chosen, but actually it was at random. And then the next stage of the experiment, the boys had to divide small amounts of money between the groups under various scenarios. And Teifel found that, that given the chance, the boys had soon at their group got more of the money, even if it meant that the boys of both groups received less overall. More surprising, perhaps, they opted for the biggest gap between their own group and the other lot, even if it meant that they themselves got less in total. And when they were asked to choose between the two groups, for two boys from their own group, and in a separate exercise between two boys from the other group, they gave more to their team, even though being equally generous to the other lot would not have hurt their own team. The journalist Ezra Klein, who wrote about this experiment in his book on political polarization, points out that these were children of a similar age, similar backgrounds, sorted at random into completely meaningless groups. And yet it was trivially easy to manipulate them into exhibiting vicious tribal behavior. And as Teifel himself observed, what mattered to the boys was not the collective good, the collective welfare, but beating the other lot as soundly as they could, even if it meant paying a price themselves. I, I raise Teifel's work because it's, I think it's a powerful way to think about real world tribal politics in an age of mistrust and conflict. And it's easiest to see this in America. Reading the newspapers, you might think that what divides America is race. In fact, less than 10% of Americans say they disprove of mixed race marriage. By contrast, 
40% of Americans say they'd be upset if their child married someone from the opposing political party. To simplify greatly, Republicans and Democrats used to be motivated by support for their own party. Now they're motivated by hatred for and suspicion of their opponents. Some of you here today may be mystified how decent, intelligent, God-fearing Republicans can possibly support a man like Donald Trump. I believe the answer lies in Typhon's work. It's because Trump has manipulated Republicans' fear of their enemies. He's convinced his tribe that the wicked, communist, woke Democrats are conducting a witch hunt against him and against them. Democrats want Republicans to believe that Trump is unfit for office, when in reality, he insists, he is all that stands between the 2024 election and the destruction of the United States. And it's worth remembering that Democrats are fired up by the same fears. For them too, and I'd argue with more reason, the future of American democracy is at stake in 2024. The other lot, they insist, are racists, misogynist, anti-gay. In fact, that anyone who supports Trump is immoral. This is the polarization that dwells on contempt for the other side rather than love for your own. Political scientists call it negative partisanship. I call it the politics of fear and loathing. And once you've started to notice it, you could spot it all around the world. In Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, facing deep legal problems, has managed to convince half the people that the other half are willing to betray their country. In Brazil, Lula's tribe thought that Bolsonaro was a corrupt coup monger, while Bolsonaro launched ads hinting that Lula was a Satanist, cannibal, and pedophile. In India, the BJP is not just focused on growth and development, though it is making a decent fist of those things, but it also bolsters its political support by building up an imaginary threat from the country's Muslim minority. And lest anyone think that I'm blind to my own country's many faults, let's not forget the Brexit and UK's crazy hysterical falling out over the nation's dinner tables. Now, being motivated by tribal hatred for the other lot is not only a feature of national politics. In Beijing, they've concluded that America will do anything to keep China down. In Washington, they're adamant to come to the United States who are the power. Likewise, Russia's motivated not by dreams of national glory, so much as grievance, fear, and resentment about NATO's cozy designs. I don't want to claim that the politics of fear and loathing is new, but I do think it's become more prevalent for lots of reasons, including the rise of social media, the rise of authoritarian China, and the ideological vacuum created by the end of the Cold War. And in the time I have left, I want to explore its consequences and to suggest some remedies. First, the consequences. One is the erosion of truth as a category for political debate. When the other world are stop at nothing lying villains, the messenger becomes more important than the message. So people are more willing to dismiss inconvenient facts as fake news. They say that awkward statistics are cherry picked, that the other world's reasoning is motivated reasoning, that technocrats or academics or elitists, or that populists are all racists and bigots. And that official accusations of misconduct are a witch hunt by the agents of the deep state. As a result, it is hard to persuade your opponents of anything that they do not already believe. And the coming era of deep fakes and, and AI adjusted messaging is only likely to make matters worse. A second consequence is the erosion of institutions. Filled with fear and loathing on the other side, and without the anchor of truth, People can be led to believe that the ends justify the means. If the election is being stolen, it's patriotic to storm the capital in Washington or to take to the streets of Brasilia. If Israel judges and no longer referees but activists, doesn't it become honorable to disobey their rulings? If companies have become vehicles for the work religion, shouldn't they be constrained by the rule? A third consequence is the erosion of wise government. You can think of democracy as having two modes that require two very different sorts of behavior. One mode is natural, and here politicians compete, no old farm. The other is legislative. Here politicians often need to find ways to compromise, not just between parties, but also as to how much of their agenda they can achieve if they are to enact legislation. But if your opponents are evil, and so are their arguments, then compromise is weak. 
in fact, it's a form of betrayal. In Britain, after the Brexit, the system had forgotten how to compromise. In the response to COVID lockdowns, treatments and vaccines should have been largely empirical questions, but the politics of fear and loathing treated them as an opportunity to be exploited in order to turn people against each other. Not only is bad, is bad government bad for the government, but it creates the sort of anger and unhappiness that just further embitters <coughs> politics. What to do? Well, let's not pretend that the remedy for fear and loathing is to seek to remove dispute and argument from politics. The contest of life over ideas must be ongoing, or else there'll be stagnation of our people. And let's not pretend that getting out of this mess will be quick or easy. But despite Michael's experiment, we should remember that past societies have put superstition behind them and have gone beyond the principle that might is right, so as to establish a certain respect for empirical truth in institutions. So here's my recipe for healing politics. The first rule is to value empathy more than righteousness. You don't have to agree with the other side, but you must be able to put yourself in their shoes and hence treat them with civility. My uncle was a lovely man, obeying, sophisticated, until we started to argue about Brexit, and I decided that he was a bigot. And now he was a lovely man again. Perhaps in those years when I found him exasperating, I was at fault too. The second rule is not to catastrophize. Pessimism is correlated with negative partisanship, because when the world is teetering on the edge of disaster, people who disagree with you start to seem like bad people and the ends start to justify the means. As a member of the press, I could say that I work in an industry that's guilty of catastrophizing the most. Empathy and a sense of proportion help with the third rule, which is that in politics, compromise is not a dirty word. As a thing that Bernard Crick observed, in most activities like writing a novel or winning a rugby match, compromise is bad and excellence is good. But in politics, compromise is what enables people with conflicting interests to come together and solve society's problems so that we can all get on with the things that really matter. And the fourth rule is to engineer society so that empathy, optimism, and compromise have a better chance. Personally, I find the BBC infuriating, but it provides a common narrative that anchors debate. And compare that with the separate universes of Fox News and CNBC. Fixed terms in the US Supreme Court would give each president one nomination every four years, taking the heat out of judicial appointments. Ranked choice voting, in which the votes of eliminated candidates are divided between those who remain, tend to reward those campaigning to the center rather than those firing on their face. Those are just a few ideas. I'm sure that we can think of many more in this session. So I'm out of time, and somehow, I would just say that we all succumb to fear and learning. That, that's how we're made. But we don't have to. We have a choice, and we should seize it. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. And for our second panellist, I'd now like to introduce Josie Pagani. Kia ora tato whanaunga, uh, and to friends and family. Uh, some, nice to see some familiar faces here. Basically what Ed said. Uh, I thought that was spot on. Um, and look, I think the premise of this talk um, is so overwhelming, isn't it? I mean, how do we fight polarisation, nationalism, the, the, the rise of, of um, fear and loathing, as Ed says? Uh, you know, it's basically how to save the world. Um, and perhaps we're trapped in this ancient curse of may you live in interesting times, because we certainly do. And there's, there's no doubt that the world has got to be a more scary place. Um, just some statistics that I came across uh, this week. 30%, uh, sorry, 60% of, of the poorest countries are near or close to or in debt, severe debt. For the first time in decades since the 50s, life expectancy has actually declined. A quarter of the world's population is now in conflict. This is a figure not seen since World War II. So certainly things are bad, but as Ed says, we can't catastrophize. Yes, democracy is under attack. Liberal values are under attack. Um, a, a Swedish think tank that I know uh, recently released a figure that said that the world's population 
uh, has increased in terms of living in autocracy. So it's risen from about 46% in 2012 to about 72% last year, the number of people living in autocracies. Uh, and, and autocracies use the things that we're familiar with, um, um, disinformation, um, uh, corruption, and, not, and social media actually banning whole platforms in social media. So, you know, blackouts are far more of a threat in, in most countries where you're dealing with autocracy rather than um, disinformation. It's just there, there isn't, it's not a viable option even to go on social media. And of course, in Ukraine, uh, people are using, Russia, Putin is using weapons to attack uh, liberal values. So, you know, we were doing so well before this recent period of the sort of, I suppose, from about 20, 2015, where we were lifting people out of poverty more so than ever in history. And I, I wonder, you know, a bleak view of this is that we could be having lived through the, you know, the 20th century, the end of the 20th century, where democracy flourished, where um, post-colonial movements flourished, you know, is the 21st century going to be defined by the collapse of that? You know, that's the bleak view. Um, and I, I wonder if part of the problem that we have is actually in the question for this session where there's an implication, you know, how do we educate the masses? How, how do we stop them resisting disinformation like, a, like an open packet of chips? You know, <laughs> there's a sense that, that we somehow have to save people from themselves. And this, I think, and Ed referred to it, this part of the problem is this slightly sneering attitude we have to popular opinion where we think we've got to educate people. Uh, what, what Thomas Piketty calls the Brahmin left, the, the modern day clerisy who, who sees themselves their role is instructing and educating the masses well the problem is the sneering isn't helping it, it's actually making things worse and and as Ed said there's a there's a sense of demonizing the other side so you look at the appeal of someone like Trump and I, I saw I read a book recently called political hypocrisy by uh, David Runciman and he talks about tries to analyze the appeal of Trump and ironically his appeal is the very fact that he lies authentically. You know? He sounds authentic, whereas Hillary Clinton, in contrast, sounded less authentic telling the truth. She looked like and felt like and sounded like a managerial professional politician who hedged answers, fake politeness, slightly evasive. So isn't that challenging to us, right? That even if Trump, you know, the fact that he's telling the lies, us calling out the lies doesn't really help because the very fact that he's lying authentically seems more trustworthy. Uh, and so how do we deal with that? Uh, which reminds me slightly of a, a quote I heard the other day of Jimmy Carter, former president of the US, who was a decent man, decent politician, who apparently used to say on his campaigns, uh, repeatedly he'd say in, in speeches, I'll never lie to you, vote for me, I'll never lie to you. To which his uh, long-serving lawyer quipped, well, you just lost the liar vote. So yeah, Trump hasn't lost the liar vote. And the problem we've got, I think, is that the strong man, like Trump, like Putin, and others across the world, they, they, they are more attractive to people than this professional managerial politician who thinks that a 10-point plan beats a five-point plan. So part of the problem is where is the moral crusade or the moral mission of politics gone? We've, we've replaced it with a kind of political politician, if you like. And then you get this... Um, emergence, I think, of a figure that I saw in the UK that probably Ed knows, where 30%, uh, this is last year, 30% of people in Britain, that's 14 million people, would rather get rid of Parliament and have a politician, a strong leader that can get things done. So, you know, that's alarming. That's the first time we've seen a figure like that in many, many years. These are people who are saying, I'd rather not have democracy, I'd rather just get things done. So when you have the level of trust in politicians, the level of trust, as Ed said, in institutions declining, and we've got it in New Zealand too, just to give you a, a, a figure there from Vic Uni, uh, it's about, I think, two out of four people think that um, uh, politicians are untrustworthy. Uh, they've got even less uh, support for political parties. They think that they're, they're not they're untrustworthy and they're not really delivering. So I think in New Zealand, if you take, and I think domestically and internationally, it's the same problem, where you've got a disconnect between the political bubble and the population. So this sort of what Rob Campbell 
those of you who've been following the latest heretic, Rob Campbell, what he calls punakitanga, you know, the, the, in, the inward-facing Wellington bubble. And just look at the makeup of Parliament, let alone media institutions, where 95% of MPs today own property compared to about 49% of the population. 90% of MPs have degrees compared to about 25% of New Zealanders. So one of the reasons why we're seeing this polarisation, disinformation and, and separation of uh, tribalism, if you like, is that there's a whole chunk of our population in New Zealand, let alone globally, who are not represented in these institutions, these liberal institutions that hold uh, us accountable for rule of law and so on, parliament, media and so on. Their views and their voices are not being heard. And that's a problem. So just to wind up, what do we do about all of this? Well, I think you know, it's partly making sure that the diversity in these institutions is increased. And yes, we have more eth ethnic diversity, we have more gender diversity, but what about class? You know, what, about the, what about the people who are left out of the economic equation? Where are their voices? And I think values matter more and more than, they, uh, than ever, uh, internationally and domestically. Look at Ukraine really interesting that when the war started last year, the general population in New Zealand was way ahead of the politicians saying, why aren't we doing more? What are we doing? What is New Zealand doing? And it, it kind of took the politicians, which I call the sort of weather vane approach to politics, where you kind of focus group and see, you know, which way should I go, rather than the signpost politicians, which go, this is where we're headed, this is the right and moral thing to do, let's head in this direction and persuade people. So I think you know, values matter, diversity matters, but also how do we become the populists? Where, where are the politicians defending liberal values, defending democracy, freedom of speech? Where are the passionate alternatives to the Trumps and the Putins and the Obama um, you know, all across the world? Where are the leaders up to the job of defending fundamental ideas of liberal democracy? Um, and the key thing, I think, is delivery as well. I mean, you, 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 you've got to, whether you're on the right or the left of politics, deliver to those who feel economically left out. And I think that's the final point I want to make, that delivery matters um, e either domestically or internationally. If you look at the right of politics, yes, the market has lifted more people out of, out of poverty than ever in history, than ever before in history. But, you know, no one on the right talks about inequality. No one talks about inequality within countries, and therefore you get the polarisation. No one in a New Zealand town ever said, well, I lost my job, but at least aggregate wages went up. You know, <laughs> you've got to deal with that. Um, and on the left, as Ed said, there's this demonisation, a focus on identity politics where, by definition, the opposing side must be bad people. The left needs to get back to making people better off, not making them better people. So politics matters and delivery matters and I think values matter in a moral foreign policy as well. So you look at Ukraine, the way that the population in New Zealand across the world were far more supportive of acting fast and quickly and um, in a muscular approach to dealing with uh, Putin's invasion uh, than the politicians were. And we have to reform post-Ukraine. We have to reform the international multilateral structure. It is unacceptable to people and voters and citizens that Russia can, sit, can chair the Security Council in the middle of, a, of an unjust, illegal war. It's unacceptable that North Korea can sit on the Nuclear Disarmament Committee at the UN. Unacceptable that Gaddafi's Libya could have chaired the Human Rights Committee. So when you have the polarisation that we're seeing, usually there's a very good reason for it, and people are disillusioned with these institutions for good reason. So we have to have the moral courage to reform the multilateral system. So, I th you know, those are just... <laughs> how we do that is another question, but, you know, those are a few kind of framings that I think we need to consider if we're going to look at how we bring, how we fight polarisation, but how we bring people back to a passionate defence of liberal values. Um, and in the end, uh, you know, a politician friend of mine in the UK once said, you know, in politics, do the things that voters say are the things. In other words, if people are worried about inequality and jobs and health and access to education and so on, focus on that, the bread and butter issues, if you like domestically and internationally. Do the things that voters say are the things. Or Justin Trudeau's political advisor once said, 
make sure the main thing is the main thing. So, you know, if we deliver to people, they're not going to go into the arms of the populace and they're not going to be tempted by disinformation like an open bag of chips. And as Biden said, we have to prove that democracy works. Then we win people back. Thank you. Thank you, Josie. Um, I'm sure no one in this room wants to see the 21st century defined by the collapse of democracy. So we've taken that wet or that challenge and the insights in this room will get us part way there, hopefully. Uh, without further ado, to get us a long way there, Sir Peter Guckman. I wear two hats and I'm not sure which one to wear in this talk. In one part, I, I'm head of the International Science Council, which is the principal not NGO in the world linking science to the multilateral system, which is rather frustrating at times, and I'll talk about that in a moment, I think. And then secondly, I head uh, the COI2, the Centre for Informed Futures in Auckland, which is a non-partisan think tank focused primarily on social uh, 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 social issues, and we will release a major report which directly reflects on the comments that Ed made earlier on on trust uh, next week. And so I'll perhaps spend a few minutes on each. A few weeks ago, I was talking to the President of the General Assembly, who's a very distinguished ambassador uh, from Hungary. He said, Peter, I want to work with you on promoting trust in science. It was somewhat surprising coming from a Hungarian diplomat, and I assumed we would then flow into a discussion on climate change or vaccination or some technical issue. But in fact, when I asked President Carosi why he wanted to work with me on trust in science, it was not that. He says, science is the nearest thing we've got to a universal language. And if I don't have trust between competing states on the issues that where we should get agreement, how can I get trust into other areas? And if you think about it, it's a very surprising but really quite deep statement. And of course, I liked it. But if you go back to the first Cold War and think about what are some of the biggest successes of the first Cold War, in diplomacy terms, arguably the Antarctic Treaty. How did the Antarctic Treaty come? It came because the organisation I head, or its predecessor, in 1957 organised the second polar year, the International Geophysical Year, and that led the members, the country, 27 countries, three years later to sign the Antarctic Treaty. Or you could argue it's the IPCC, formed in 1988, coming from a meeting which my organisation put together in 1985 of scientists to say the multilateral system had to take climate change seriously. So science, run from within the scientific community, can drive diplomatic change and drive trust. And I could spend a lot of time on that and perhaps in another forum I would do so. But just to say in the more specifics, given the, the earlier speeches this morning from the Minister and the Prime Minister, we're heavily involved in thinking about how science can be better integrated in the Pacific, developing an academy of, the, of the arts, sciences, the humanities for the Pacific to bring the small countries together as they've done in the Caribbean. We're working heavily with, uh, with ma many countries on the issues of what happens when the second Cold War emerges when the hot fighting in Eastern Europe di dies down. And we're working heavily to try and see how a very broken multilateral system can use science and other aspects of culture much more better, much more than we can. And indeed that flows on to discussions I've been having with the Commonwealth Secretary General on the issues of science and the global self of the Commonwealth, but that's for another time. Ed's already raised the issues that are most important. We evolved as social animals, and we evolved as social animals to live in small groups. And those small groups def were defined 
by rules, informal, ultimately becoming more formal, that said what you did as the in-group, to stay in the in-group, and you'd contested against other groups, the out-groups. But as societies got larger, we've actually found only two ways to organise large-scale societies. One is autocracy, be it in the form of a religious autocracy, a dictatorship, a monarchy, and most of human history has been built around autocracies of one form or another, or the relatively young and fragile experiment of democracy. And then you need to think about what is democracy? It's a complicated concept. Democracy depends on two dimensions of trust, coming back to Ed's uh, uh, story. We talk a lot about social trust in New Zealand, that is how people who have different world views can respect and listen to each other and the discussion as Josie raised should be one on ideas, not on personality. And most of the discussion about social cohesion, particularly since the mosque attacks, has been about different communities of ethnic or other origins. But we don't talk a lot about the other key dimension of trust, and that's institutional trust. Democracies fundamentally depend on institutional trust. And as both Ed and Josie has talked about, it's been de diminished in recent years. What is institutional trust? Well, it's trust between those who are governed and those who are, who are in government and the institutions around them. And it's very fragile, as we've seen in countries offshore, and I think we're seeing sense that it's even fragile in New Zealand. The report that we'll release next week is going to focus particularly on the issues of, con of, of, of institutional trust because it's not talked about enough. The behaviour of politicians, the way the institutions respond, the accountability, the quality of the fourth estate, which I'm sorry, Josie, has declined in New Zealand uh, as a mechanism of accountability uh, over recent years. These are the issues that matter. Now, social and institutional trust are not independent of each other. Clearly, when you have lost faith in government, it makes you more likely to have a different view of the people around you. When you are seeing shit happening around you, you will have less faith in the government. And so there are many factors, and I could spend the next two hours talking about the role of inequality, the role of decolonisation, the role of this, the role of that, in what undermines social trust, but we don't spend enough time thinking about what undermines role in institutional trust. Now, there's a vicious circle here, because as Will Davis, the famous sociologist from Britain, pointed out, there's a reciprocal relationship. When people are scared, they want strong leaders. Josie pointed out the statistics around that. Strong leaders know that by keeping people scared, they make them more likely to support strong leaders. And so you end up driving this autocratic shift, which has happened in democratic countries, exacerbated by the autocratic tendencies, which many leaders loved during COVID. And we've seen that around the world, that people, or that democracies were slow to reduce that tendency following COVID. But there's another factor which we need to bring into the space. Calestis Juma, probably the most famous scholar ever of innovation, pointed out, when change happens rapidly, people get anxious. And we're in a phase of very rapid change, technologically, sociologically. Just think how social boundaries have changed over the last 50 years. The rapid pace of change, we could talk at length about AI, large language models, uh, uh, chat GPT, and so forth. All of this is right at the edge because these tools, we're already anxious and we're now driving a set of tools that will undermine social and institutional trust if we don't work out how to regulate them. But 
how are we going to regulate them? Number one is traditional means of regulation are too slow. We still can't get our heads around the fact that it's 30 years since we, we put a break on GM and yet the world's moved on around us. And it's unlikely that the multilateral system is competent to deal with it because the, tech, the interests of China, Russia, Europe and America do not align in this area. So we're at a very vulnerable time and in my role as president of the International Science Council, we're involved in thinking about how, just in the case of the Antarctic, just in the case of, 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 of climate change, there may be a place for the non-governmental organisations to take a lead here in thinking through these profound, deep issues which will undermine social and institutional trust in all democratic societies, if we're not careful, no matter what the upsides are. We all know there are many upsides to these technologies. And these are the issues that worry me. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sir Peter. Um, so now the floor is open to you, uh, our audience, um, to answer questions of our panellists, but also remembering the reason we're all here, which is to get solutions. And we've had some um, presented to us today by the panellists, but I believe there would also be solutions in this room, particularly from our students. So as the Minister and the Prime Minister said this morning, your role here today as students is important. Your perspective is powerful and particularly looking to the future in a world where technology um, is so dominant and you are, are, are digital natives and, and have the power to help improve public understanding of, of international affairs. Uh, so I'll open the floor now to the room. I think we have a roaming mic. So just... Sure. Tēnā koutou can you hear me? Oh. Tenakota Kato. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your contributions. Um, I wanted to, Edward Carr, I wanted to push back on a comment you made um, about compromise is not a dirty word in politics. Um, when we're looking at things that's happening in America, especially, in, and the UK too, with <coughs> anti trans bills, don't say gay bills, um, the removal of books from libraries that have any reference to colonial history or anything to do with wokeness, quote unquote. Um, and even in the UK as well with, with tightening laws around refugees and, and welcoming people into the country and also anti-trans bills too, denying healthcare. Um, for a lot of these marginalized groups, they feel like compromise um, is the acceptance of maybe giving up their human rights to exist. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to push you on that. Thanks. Uh, shall I answer, Mark? Well, yeah, um, well, uh, thank you for that question. Um, I've got a very strange feedback on my audio. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think the way to think about this is that um, democratic politics is a repeated game. It's not a one-off game. Um, and um, it's much better to sustain the institutions, to sustain the idea that people can work together to solve problems gradually, than to feel like everything exists on one roll of the dice. The example Bernard Crick gives, which is, is a particularly interesting one, and I do, I do recommend his book in Defense of Politics if you get a chance to read it. He was, a, he was writing that, I think, in the 70s or 80s, so it's, all, it's a while back. But he looks back to Lincoln's attempts to keep the union together. Um, and, and, and in the end, it resulted in civil war. So it doesn't always succeed, but uh, Lincoln went to enormous lengths to compromise in order to try and keep the union together, knowing that if he did keep the union together, he could fight another day and gradually get to where he wanted, which was abolition. Um, so uh, uh, that's the way I approach these things. Uh, and um, if you couch the debate in, in, in absolute terms as if everything is a matter of life or death today, uh, then you end up driving people apart and driving institutions apart. Um, it, it isn't all over today. 
there's a, it's a repeated game. There are many chances over many years to make things gradually better. Thanks, Ed and Josie. You will have um, something to say. I think all our panelists have something song? to say. <laughs> Okay, um, just to add, to add to what Carr said, I think when you when you think about the word compromise, it isn't about compromising your values or your beliefs. It's it's about how do you be effective, right? So, if you think of the marriage equality bill, um, we I mean years, decades of of protesting, fighting, uh, un, um, you know, a, awful, um, abusive, homophobic um, positions, right? We got it over the line because, in the end, the movement appealed to the family values, the sort of traditional values of their opposition, and kind of convinced a whole bunch of people who, who never thought they'd be convinced that actually this is, this is legislation worth supporting. So while it can be morally satisfying to take a very um, uh, tough position and, and necessary to do that, ultimately what gets it over the line is the appeal acro across the tribes, you know, to different tribes, and that's what comp compromise isn't isn't easy. <laughs> you know, it's not it's not something that's a kind of beige, Fifty Shades of Beige, political alternative to something that is that is morally and just, moral and just. So, so I think it's if you think about the Green Party here, you know, there's the fight within the Green Party, for example, between someone like James Shaw, who's going, well, I want to be in government to get legislation done to get stuff done, or do I want to be outside of government where I can take a different position and not persuade as many people? Persuasion is actually what politics is about, and it's how you get things done. The alternative is not democratic, right? So I wouldn't think of it as a small, weak word. It's a strong, tough word, compromise. I think the dynamics of the last few years and the shift which is reflected in effective polarization, which Ed talked about, namely where the opposition is viewed as the enemy, has changed enormously. So the data from America, but it's also evidence in other countries, including New Zealand, is a Democrat is defined by hating a Republican, not their ideas, just hating them as a tribe, and vice versa. And we've got to work out a way to step back from rhetoric, from the debate amongst politicians being rhetoric, to a debate about ideas. And that's been very much undermined by social media, by the short news cycles, by uh, the end of long-form journalism, except in a very few places. And it's certainly not in the public eye, because most people get their news feed in a way that is not long-form journalism any longer. And so that the issue and the challenge, which again we'll release a report on next week, is about how do we step back from a society which is very short-term focused, based on you know 280 character tweets, uh, YouTube, TikTok, et cetera, et cetera, and get back to a contestation of ideas. Because democracy was all meant to be about we may not agree, but we can agree on the rules around how agreement is reached. And that's been lost. And, and so, so this is a key issue. I think one of the big debates, which is not for today, will be whether reducing the threshold in MMMP will actually more fracture rather than actually combine in New Zealand society. But that's for another time. Well, I... I wonder if it is relevant, though, Sir Peter, just because you've raised that electoral reform review that's come out and it's topical, how much is a three-year term contributing to some of the points you're making that are contributing to mistrust of their former son? I think it's more than the three-year term. It's a shallow democracy. We have a very, very simple democratic system. We have a single chamber vote with a strong, a small parliament with a strong party whip, so nobody ever breaks the rules, and so you effectively elect a cabinet uh, as a dictatorship every three years. There's select committees are therefore very weak because the parliament's too small to have a permanent class of backbencher, and we don't have an upper house for review. So the real issue in New Zealand, I th a real issue in New Zealand is the shallow nature of our democratic structure, which is based on a very high trust model in a world which is now lower trust. 
And the issue, I think, is about deepening our democracy. Now, four-year term, I actually agree with, because I, from my 10 years watching the beehive, it's two, the three years is a problem. But I don't think it will fix the issues we're talking about without finding structures to make stronger select committees, greater accountability. I, actually, I mean, we don't have an upper house, but that would be the mechanism that most countries use to get that deeper democracy. And so we've seen, and it comes from both political, both, both sides of the house. So I'm not making a statement about it. Where governments are elected and do things of dramatic nature which they've never given the electorate any chance to even reflect upon, and that's how, why the public get upset. That's effectively how MMP occurred in the first place. And so these issues of a shallow democracy, I don't mean, I mean shallow in the sense it doesn't have the checks and balances and accountabilities of, uh, that, that it needs. And that, I think, is our real problem. Thank you. Check, check, cool. Um, hello, uh, thank you all so much for your contributions. Yeah, you guys all spoke really, really well. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tejas, I'm a master's student at Vic. Uh, I've got a question um, about something that you said, Ms. Pagani. Um, I, I'm in complete agreement with you that class is something, is a lens that we do have to apply um, and have to um, take into account. But I also wonder, are we losing out on the analysis of the intersection between race and class? A lot of times, a lot of the m stuff that was mentioned just now, like Brexit and uh, and the Trump era and their attitudes toward migrants, um, the people who are disenfranchised in the middle class or the white middle class seem to blame migrants or scapegoat them as the issue. So it's not just about class; it transcends that into where race still matters. So people in the same class, but you know, the people in a marginalized race face the brunt of the blame. Um, you know, um, Mexicans are coming stealing my jobs or whatever, Brexit, you know, all this kind of fear mongering um, that happens that transcends class. So I was just wondering if you could. Yeah, comment. that's a really good point. And I think, my, I suppose my point is that you're right. And I think the way you get beyond a kind of tribalism around that where you're going, Mexicans are stealing my jobs, um, or, uh, um, uh, you know, South Island, uh, uh, South Auckland is Pacific and Māori, blah, blah, blah. The way you get around that is to actually talk about inequality and poverty because then suddenly you have white New Zealanders, Pākehā New Zealanders going, yeah, I'd feel that too. So you start to kind of create a, a, a common experience and unity around what the real problem is, which is poverty, right, and and access to jobs and so on, of which racism is, is a part. And th there's no doubt that in New Zealand, for example, uh, the working class, to put it bluntly, is brown. So you have to have that conversation and you have to have that lens, yes, but you bring more people with you if you talk, and Glenn Lowry, do you know Glenn Lowry in the US, talks a lot about this, the African-American uh, academic, about you know if you talk about inequality and poverty in America, you are going to, rather than say affirmative action, you're gonna start, you're gonna start bringing more people into the, um, the case to be made for dealing with that. Um, and I come back to Parliament where, you know, it used to be in the 70s, I think it was about 70% of MPs in, in the New Zealand Parliament were of the managerial class, you know, professional managerial, directly before they came into Parliament. So they had, you know, professional jobs, um, white collar jo um, jobs. And about 20 to 30% were clerical, working class jobs, blue collar jobs. Today, 100% of MPs have come directly from a managerial or professional job. In other words, you, have, you don't have a, working a direct working class voice in Parliament, and that matters. We don't even use the word working class. I mean, I'm saying it, and I can sense a lot of people room going, oh my God, she's returning to the class war of the 70s, you know, as if class doesn't exist anymore. And I'm not. I'm just saying that that diversity, and, and it is predominantly brown in New Zealand, needs to be represented. It used to be, I have a Labour background, uh, Labour Party don't talk to me anymore, but um, <laughs> it used to be that, the that if you joined the Labour Party, you joined the Labour Party to make your life better off, your family, your community, because you represented that community. Now you join the Labour Party to make somebody else's life better off. You know, there's a sort of tilted head of compassion on the left that, that um, has alienated a lot of the people that actually the left should be representing. Sort of answers the question. 
Thank you, Josie. Yeah. I'm just down here. Uh, kia ora, my name's Taylor Lee. Um, my question is kind of pertaining to the healing politics that Ed was talking about because I think that's super important in the conversation about um, public understanding of international affairs because I personally feel that our politics has become quite depersonalised and quite elitist and that is creating a massive disconnect between um, people's voices actually being heard in politics. So I was just wondering maybe for Josie how you feel um, the media, I know you don't speak on behalf of the media, but how um, you kind of view the media role in, I guess, facilitating this, yeah. um, but also the role that you feel empathy does have in connecting the public to the political. I'll, I'll give a quick answer and then I'd be curious to hear from Ed too, because so, I think that was a really fantastic way of framing it. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't represent the media. I'm not a journalist. I've got what is politely called a portfolio career, <laughs> which means that I do a whole bunch of things. Um, and I think the media, as Ed said, is, is, is culpable in, in some of the polarisation that we're seeing. And it's partly, I mean, I write a column for staff. Um, you know, I, sometimes I, I, I've written a column for the New York Times where I was able to say more and be more opinionated and, and a bit more, um, uh, take a few more risks with my opinions than I, wa than I was able to with staff. So I think there is, um, and there's a sort of culture in the media of going, that's offensive, that's harmful, you can't say that. Well, again, morally satisfying to have that position, but not very effective. Empathy is far more effective. But also, if you start saying, oh, we can't say that because that's offensive, can't say that because that might create harm, well, um, guess what? Those rules get used by your opponents too. So it's really revealing to me that the anti that the slavery the slave owners of the South during the anti-slavery movement in America um, lobbied for anti-hate legislation because they said that those who were campaigning against slavery were causing harm to the white population of the South and offence, and it was creating the potential for violence. All the arguments that we use today to ban stuff and ban speech. You ban speech, you don't actually deal with what Ed talks about, the need to stretch across the tribes. But yeah, I'd be really keen to hear what Ed has to say about that. Ed. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Josie. This is a very interesting question. I mean, uh, the, the British press is about as polarizing and as unpleasant as, as any anywhere, from as far as I can tell. Um, so it's very, and it's very sort of tribal. I, I guess a couple of things strike me. Um, the first is the, the first is the importance of reporting, um, and uh, I'm a firm believer that that actually meeting and talking about real people and doing the reporting and finding the examples of stories that surprise you and confound you and challenge your expectations. Um, are, are, is, a, is a sort of great way to force you to step outside of your preconceptions as a journalist. And one of the consequences of um, the way that the media has developed over the past 15 or 20 years is, is that there's less and less reporting, actually. I mean, people sit at their desks more and more and they sort of go, you know, get, get press releases and rewrite them and they dig into stuff on the web and rewrite that. But the actual uh, amount of money that's spent on meeting real people and talking to them is, has gone down a lot. I think that's one worry. The second worry is that, is that the, the press particularly in, I don't know the, how much a problem this is in New Zealand, but it's a big problem in the US and the UK. The press is less local than it used to be. It's more national. And, and one of the sort of polarizing aspects, it's very, very clear if you look at the US, is, is the way that all issues are becoming national issues. And national issues fall directly into this sort of polarizing machine that, that uses everything as, as, as ammunition for the culture wars. Whereas local issues about real people, real solving real problems, real context. And again, that gets people involved in the real world rather than sort of fired up on the imaginary world of ideological conflict. So how does one deal with that? Um, <clears throat> well, Localism is really important. I think cities are really important. Um, I think um, there's room for uh, uh, all sorts of um, ventures in journalism that try and establish that. But, but you are swimming against the tide, I fear. 
I, I do want to comment. Uh, I don't think people realise New Zealand's, the AUT surveys show that New Zealand's trust in mainstream media is one of the lowest in the OECD. And we should need to reflect on why that is the case. Uh, it's very low, even lower than it is in the US or in Britain. And that probably reflects what our mainstream media are actually delivering. It's not of much value. And then on top of that, most people no longer get their news from most mainstream media. They're getting it from streaming, from different, from, from, from social media, or, or not getting it at all. And of course, in Auckland, where we have a large ethnic diversity, a large number of people are getting their information from non-English sources, particularly Chinese sources. So again, you see a, a, a situation here where we don't actually understand fully and the role of the fourth estate as a critical protector of democracy is therefore weakened. But coming back to Haley's question and to an earlier comment, I think there's one other development which is happening around the world and we're at the heart of experiments on it here. Democracy needs new tools. At the end of the day, that's democracy needs new tools. Now, part of that may be, as I talked about before, in the structure of what happens in Wellington, but I think citizens' juries, citizens' assemblies, hybrid forum, new forms of electronic consultations, the one we've been doing over transport in New Zealand and so forth, and as Europe uses now extensively, particularly in Holland and in some of the Scandinavian countries, empower people in a different way. And I think ultimately, in a democracy, however it operates, it's when people feel that their voice has been heard, even if the decision goes against their, 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 their bias, they feel that their voice has genuinely been heard. That's what leads to social, con social consensus, social cohesion. Thank you, Sir Peter. This is from Anita Perkins. What about the role of power in this? Is sharing power a key to trust? Sir Peter spoke about the role of NGOs as possible solution to thinking through and responding to rapid change where traditional regulation and multilateral systems aren't showing up as adequate, adequate dynamic solutions for today's complex issues. But this would require a degree of power sharing, agency sharing, which is sometimes not easily given, given over, thus possibly preventing change or new solutions. Yeah, there's a, there's a massive problem with centralisation in our democracy. And again, this is a sort of punakitanga um, problem where uh, we saw it in COVID, we've seen it, uh, um, whether you're looking at health policy, education policy, where there's, a, there's, there's not enough reaching out beyond the Wellington bubble to business representatives, NGO representatives to go, what is the best solution here? You know. How do you reach Māori communities with a vaccine? <laughs> Turns out Māori know better than Wellington. Um, bureaucracies uh, who, can t who, can, who can design a fantastic uh, vaccine rollout for people living in Kilburnie. Um, so yeah, there, there is a problem with centralisation and power sharing. I, I would say devolution is one of the big solutions we, or, or uh, when you say democracy needs more tools, um, the, the ability to devolve to local councils, local communities, iwi groups, uh, far more resources, far more decision making um, is one of the most hopeful things actually and I'd like to see more of it in our system. I agree with you Peter about select committees. I've been talking a lot recently about you know, if we could have something similar to the US system, not in, not in the bad ways, in the good ways, uh, where you have, if you're a politician, you can have an executive career path, go into cabinet, Let's have a much smaller cabinet, by the way. Um, or you can have a legislative pathway where you go into a really beefed up select committee, resource to do the policy work, resource to do the research, where you get a whole bunch of um, uh, policy work done, either as, as an opposition MP or as uh, an MP in government. Um, and that would make both our opposition and our government uh, um, MPs and policy work far more robust. So lots more we can do. I, I, I agree with that, obviously, but I do think that the future, and we're seeing this in Europe happening quite rapidly, is these new, uh, it's local empowerment through local decision making, 
through a variety of either in-person and digital consultation techniques. And some of them became, could be quite deliberative. Of course, the most famous of those was the Citizens' Jury Assembly in Ireland over the abortion debate. But, but it's been done in many other ways around the world it, at much smaller levels. The work that was done in Auckland by COI2 earlier this year on where the next water supply for Auckland will come from. The work that's going on now about thinking about what's the future of road user charges and how that will, has been done through electronic deliberative consultation. These are new techniques that bring people into the discussion from the beginning, not the pseudo consultation which our government departments are very good at doing, where the decision's already been made and you're given a, 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 and 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 the block to answer is, is trivial. Thank you. Do we have another question? Oh, plenty. Um. Uh, kia ora tato. My name is Aramiro Tairakana. Oof, what an impressive panel. Thank you so much for your time. I have a brief comment and then a question. My comment will just be on um, the word tribalism. I'm a member of a iwi, or tribe as we usually translate it, and uh, our iwi cooperates often with lots of other iwi, and it also fights lots with lots of other iwi. That sounds like Fano. that sounds like communities, that sounds like nations. Uh, it feels really tiresome to hear the word tribalism used as uh, a, a, another word for uh, when people aren't able to cooperate in their broader interests. It seems like a word that's only used by people who aren't members of tribe. I'd really challenge people using that word in the future. Uh, my question would be on its point about um, catastrophizing um, in the media sector. It feels like there is a really strong incentive to uh, do that, and I'd be really interested in hearing more about the thought that goes on um, within media organizations in the newsroom about that balance between not catastrophizing versus the incentives versus fear of losing your audience. That, thank you very much. Good question. Ed, would you like to jump in there? Yeah. Um, well, well, you're completely right. Um, all the incentives are that way. It's a funny thing. Uh, there's a huge asymmetry. Um, if, if you warn that something awful is going to happen um, and it doesn't happen, either people forget or you claim that your warning was very well received uh, and people took evasive action. Um, if you predict something good and it doesn't happen, then it's a disaster and you made a fool of yourself. The asymmetry is is terrible. So I, th I think you're completely right. Um, so, you know, what, what are the things pushing in the other direction? Um, and they're, they're, they're relatively weak, I have to say. I mean, there's a sense of professionalism, a sense of conscience, a sense of, um, you know, if you, if you go too far, you look a bit stupid, but there is definitely a bias towards saying everything is awful. Um, and there is a reminds me of a quote by the he, former head of uh, MI5 in this country, who, whose job is to warn politicians about all the awful things that might happen. Um, many of them won't happen. And he, he, he does make a valid point when he says, you know, you think of all the things that could happen and, and that didn't happen. Um, and, and those are the sorts of things that we have to warn people about. So there is there is an enormous bias towards catastrophizing and. So Peter in his speech took, spoke about human nature, and it's human nature to be more interested in catastrophizing than, than in um, sort of bland good news. It's very often when, when one's in these panels, what's interesting about this one is that we have spoken quite a lot about solutions, but normally in these panels, you know, people, they always say they're going to be about solutions, but what people really do is they rub their hands together and predict how awful, how terrible things are, and there is very few very few optimistic solutions um, at all. So uh, that's not a, I don't have a solution for that. Your, your observation though, I think is, is absolutely right. I've been in this industry for a long time uh, and it's always the, Cassandra, no, it's the, Cassandra's the wrong word actually. It's always the Jeremiah's who, uh, who do best. Oh, so Peter. Oh. Oh. Of course, the whole of the modern information industry is, in, is based on the information economy. And it's been well demonstrated, particularly on Twitter, that negative news spreads far more better than positive news. And that's been used uh, by a lot of people in both uh, in different forms of the media, but particularly in the digital media, to actually drive this, this kind of mindset that we've been talking about. Now, the reasons for it are, uh, as Ed's just said, based on our cognitive 
biases, and we all have cognitive biases and angry biases that, that make us think the way we do. And the difficulty, for instance, in the failures of, of long-term thinking, uh, because we are biased to think short-term rather than long-term. And I think one of the fundamentals in all that we've been talking about here today is how does society shift from short-term to long-term thinking? Because until we do that, these deep, wicked problems, which mm -hmm. don't ever have a simplistic solution, despite what any politician says, will not be resolved. And therefore, the, one of the real interesting things is New Zealand has some of the shortest time preferences of any Western society. Mm -hmm. We tend to think more about the here and now than most societies. And the challenge of how we actually get, and I think it comes back to our political structure, frankly, mm. uh, with the challenge of how we get more long-term thinking is, I think, the real challenge for New Zealand, whether it's over social, economic, uh, environmental issues. We just are not thinking long-term. And, and that, I think, uh, uh, we are in some small places, but we don't generally think long-term. Thank you. That's Pākehā view. Māori view would be very different. And, I, and we could talk about that at least. Josie, you can have the last word. We are out of time. but Oh, I, I was just going to say, when I, um, I used to comment about the Labour Party in opposition, we were in opposition for like nine years, and I'd say, well, yeah, can we stop sounding like miserable, urban miserableists, you know, <laughs> who say the world's going to hell in a handbasket, and by the way, you're fat, you know, eat, stop eating sugar and, you know... <laughs> And it was like, really, you know, how, how do you think people are going to vote for that? It's just miserable, catastrophizing. Um, and, you know, as a result, Labor was in opposition for nine years. Um, but, you know, Ed's right about resisting the catastrophizing, and I think this is really important. You can have, you can have multiple states of emergency. You know, we, we, we're declaring states of emergency for everything at the moment, from uh, climate to LGBTQI, a, we, we, it doesn't help. Is it helping us get good climate policy? No because we get good climate policy with, con with consideration about weighing the costs and benefits of good climate policy, right? So a state of c catastrophe, a state of emergency, isn't actually helping us solve some of these wicked problems. Mm. Thank you, Josie. And um, I think also your point at the very beginning about not being able to educate the masses is a really key point for us as well, because you cannot increase understanding of public International, public understanding of international affairs if people don't care to think about it or understand what it means for them. So Minister Mahuta said this morning foreign, foreign policy has never been so important and, and that is true because of the challenges in, that are global in nature that we're facing but that is not what the public see at this point in time. There is no empowerment as you say Sir Peter and there is catastrophizing in the media Ed. So thank you very much to our panel. We could probably talk for a couple more hours on this and thank you especially to our students and for their questions. As I said, your perspective is powerful in this conversation and a, and a lot of big conversations. Ngā mihi nui. Ed, uh, Sir Peter and Josie and audience.